comes and as I'm saying, and I remember the occasion, and the produce and the shelves and the racks. Pastor, been down to my place where I've got the recording uh, works going, and I've got shelf after shelf after shelf after shelf after shelf. I mean, good, sturdy shelves that used to have groceries, and now they've got my preaching tapes and my videotapes and my all of my uh, equipment on them, and all of it cost me nothing. Why? They rolled it out. Beside the dumpster, they didn't put that in the dumpster. They just knew the it was too big to go through the door. But it was just right to go through my door into my office, hey, amen. Yeah. And so all that cost me nothing, and I could just go on and on and on with that. I was down in McClendon, Florida, one time, in a revival with Brother Neville down there at the Emmanuel Baptist Church. And that dear pastor, he'd been so gracious to us. He had fed us and cared for us. I preached about seven or eight revivals for him. And I was down there one of the last times we was with him. He's old and retired now and maybe not even alive. I'm not sure. But uh, I, I needed something. I forgot what it was. And, uh, and so we were preparing our own meals at that time. So my wife said, uh, uh, it's just right out here's a piggly with me. It said, go out there and get it if you will. So I went out there. But always when I'd go to the store for something, I'd go to the back before I'd go in the front. Just to see you know, if it's already, already there free. And so I went to the back. And lo and behold, just as I started to go toward the dumpster, here was a man opening the back door and had one of those flat four-wheel buggies and he come rolling it out there with two banana boxes filled with wood-hard, frozen, half-gallon ice cream cartons. What about that? I didn't know if there had been some discovery of some bad formula that they had to remove it from the shelves. I inquired and found out, nope, we've got a machine that is not holding proper temperature. We're going to have to have a man work on it. And he said he couldn't work on it until he got it emptied. So here they come with all that 22 half gallons of butter, pecan, and chocolate, and, and, and fudge ripple, and shut your mouth, Harold. I mean, <laughs> and there we were in a motel room without even a refrigerator. <coughs> but you know what I did? I called the pastor and I said, Pastor, just want to ask you a question. Do you like ice cream? He said, oh yeah, I like ice cream. I said, I eat a little about every night if I have it. I said, well, you, go, you got it. You got it. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? I said, you got it in the room in your freezer? He said, it has to be below half right now. Why? I said, I'm coming to your house. Make room. I've got 22 half gallons, 11 gallons of hard, fresh ice cream that's not even out of date. And so he and I rejoice, especially him, that he has a freezer full of ice cream. I, I'm just saying, you wouldn't believe the waste in America <coughs> unless you saw what I have seen. Strange places where God provided so wonderfully well. Let me give you some more. I was in a revival in 2001 in Irvington Bible Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Now that's a place I've never preached anywhere close to. Indianapolis, Indiana. But this pastor invited me and I went to preach that revival and did. 2001, that's a little over 10 years ago. We had a good revival. The pastor was very pleasant and very excited and delighted and the people received us wonderfully well. Somehow or another, I never got another word from him. Another invitation. In fact, Often have been the times that I just didn't hear from a pastor after one revival, and I always in my mind wondered, did I not get the job done that he was hoping to get done? Ten years plus ago, last year, I hadn't heard a smidgen from him since 2001. Not, a, not, not one line written, but... I got a phone call last year from him. He said, Brother Lee, just hadn't heard from you in a long time. I wonder how you do. Still on the circuit? I said, yes, not quite as I used to be, but I'm still a going, thank the Lord. He said, well, I just have never, never got the gratitude out of my heart for what you did for our church when you came through. He said, our church 
took off by leaps and bounds. I said, it's always been in my heart so, so much to somehow show you gratitude. I said, I talked to the church about it, and we decided if your address is still the same, or I'll get the new address. We want to send you a thousand dollars. Yeah. Amen. Mules in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had no idea he even remembered the name, but it is. A thousand dollars at a time that we couldn't have used it any better. Amen. I'm just saying, you do the Father's bidding in the Father's time as the Father has dispatched and do it if necessary alone, even at yes. distance and hardship. Amen. God keeps good records Amen. and it rewards wonderfully to those who serve Him well. Are you listening? That was Irvington, Indiana. Let me go a little further. Let me tell you about out west going toward Montana and uh, where did Ron live? Uh, huh? Darlene's son. Oh, Brian. Brian. Wyoming. Wyoming. Wyoming was, was going out that way to revivals that would take us out to Washington State, and then down into California, other revivals coming back through Texas and other states. And we was going out that way, and of course some of those trips would have to take two days to get from church to church. So we'd stop and get a motel and spend the night before we drove on the next day. We stopped at a motel, spent the night, a little small crummy motel. They didn't clean it too well, but the sheets looked clean, so we got a good night's sleep before we took off in the morning. But always, oh my, after a few early years, leaving so many things behind. Anybody ever stayed in the motel and left something you didn't mean to leave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we've done that so much that I just don't take a risk. I, after my wife checks all the drawers, I go out and check all the drawers. After the wife checks the shelves, I check the shelves. But this time, as most often I do, I got on my knees, picked up the covers, and looked under the bed. And there was some big old something, another white under there, and I couldn't figure out what it was, but it didn't look like it was alive and would bite me, so I just reached under there, and I pulled it out. And it was a neck brace. Have you ever seen somebody with a broken neck that's not supposed to turn the head any more than that, that would have a white neck brace holding them real stiff like that, and it had to turn like this to, to you, you ever seen one? Yeah. Somebody evidently had to sleep under the bed and left their, <laughs> left their brakes under the bed. No, somehow or another it got kicked under there and somebody left and left it there. And I pulled it out and looked at it, and my wife said, what are you gonna do with it? I said, take it with us. I don't have one. <laughs> if I don't have one, I'm going to need one. So I throw it in the car, and she, of course, you don't know who wore that thing. You don't might have the head like that. <laughs> of course, if you've been a woman, she raised a little ruthless. If you've been a man, I'm stubborn. So we and the neck brace went on down the road. <laughs> went on out to Montana to a meeting out there. And lo and behold, what was it, just a crick in her neck? Jennifer? No, she hurt she her neck. Jennifer, somehow or another, about, uh, about four days into the revival, unpredictable, but she hurt her neck, and she couldn't bear, she woke up in the morning, I'm just in pain all the time, my neck, my neck, my neck. I realized we had trouble. I went to the doctor, took her to the doctor, the doctor examined her, and told us what the problem was. But he said, really, there's not a lot you can do with this particular injury except just let it heal itself, but you'll have to get a neck brace to do it. I didn't tell him, but I thought, that ain't no problem. <laughs> that ain't no problem at all. I said, how much do they cost? He said, about $22. I said, consider it done. <laughs> and so we went to the back of the motel and I got to laugh at my wife and our daughter. 
You see now, God knew you'd need this neck brace and strange things are waiting at strange places for those that obey the will of God. I've had so many incidents like that. I could write a book, but I don't live long enough to get the book written. But I'm telling you tonight that God has so many times done things like that for us. Freeport. That's uh, up in Maryland. Freeport, Maryland, out of Oakland. There's a church up there that you could honestly say it's in a wilderness. From Oakland, Maryland, you drive through some mountains. I mean curvy roads and mountains. Then you get off on a little paved area for about an eighth of a mile, after which it turns to no more hardly than a wagon track right through the woods. There's no houses. They're just woods, woods, woods. And for about a mile through the woods, you finally come to an opening, and there sits a big white church Brother Bill Foster, do you remember meeting Bill Foster, Ben and James, pastor up there at the King James Bible Church? And so we went up there for revival, and his congregation were anywhere from 18 to 28. A big crowd would be called 35 there, and most of those were on their Social Security aging people. I don't guess there's four young people or children in the whole congregation. But I had a good meeting Sunday morning through Friday night. And that church, when I finished, I would be surprised. I would have been surprised if that congregation of those mountain people in the mountains and in a wilderness section of the mountains, I would have been surprised if they could have given me $300. And many churches far more able give us less than that. But when they handed me the check and we came down the road, I was $1,260 richer than when I went to that church. Amen. Amen. Mules in the wilderness. I mean, you just can't judge where God's going to meet your need and abundantly meet it, but just be obedient and do what God says do. Let me give you another one. Leave when you're tired. Uh, <laughs> Boonsville, Indiana. I was down in Alabama going for a revival up in Boonesville, Indiana. And I drove up that way on Saturday because my meeting will start Sunday morning. And I had a little difficulty on the trip, but I got into uh, uh, the Indiana area and got on those secondary roads going out to Boonville, which is really just a little hamlet of a place. You could call it the wilderness, but today's standards of towns and villages and got out to Boonville, Indiana, but we didn't get there until about 2.30 in the morning. That is Saturday night, Sunday morning, 2.30. And here I am at the motel. And what did I find? It was a little eight-room occupancy. Eight rooms. A little pop and mom-owned motel. And therefore, when 11 o'clock came, they shut the door, locked it, and if you were in the room, you were sleeping. If you were out of the room, you couldn't get in. And there I was, 2.30 in the morning. And I didn't have any way to get to the bed. And I went to the window, and the curtains were drawn, and I saw that bed in there. But I couldn't get to it. I didn't feel the justifiable to break a window and go in or kick the door down or nothing like that. And I did not know what to do. And I got to thinking. God, you sent me here to teach Sunday school in the morning and to preach after that and to preach tomorrow night and you know my body is beat. I'm 